I'll bring out Mike and Tracy. It's already on. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Fine, thanks, great. Well, welcome, Now I'm so glad everybody uh, could you know, find the time on this lovely, lovely day to come inside and attend this lecture concert. Um, this is a continuation of the lecture concerts I started last year, um, and fortunately, we have uh, Mark Salmon, who played for us last year for the Chopin and Liszt, coming back with his son. Um, Mark, please stand up. <laughs> Just to refresh your memory, Mark is a graduate of the Juilliard School. He also did studies at MIT and is a resident here in Seattle with his two sons and lovely wife, Sarah. Um, Mark is renowned for doing all 32 of the Beethoven uh, sonatas during the um, bicentennial of his death, I think. Well, anyway, um, and we hope maybe next year for the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, that Mark will come back and play some more Beethoven along with his son, Benjamin. Benjamin, could you please stand up? <laughs> Benjamin, uh, while he was still in high school, was acclaimed as one of the great rising pianists of the Seattle area. Uh, this uh, semester, his, his finishing semester at Stanford, and he is doing a, a degrees in performance as well in philosophy. And so we're very lucky to have the two of them here to perform two piano works. I know that's a bit of an unusual idiom for people to experience, but um, before the record player, the radio, the CD, iTunes, the piano was the internet. It was your little orchestra. It, and so many, many of the great symphonies and operas were transcribed for solo piano as well as duo piano to get the full effect when you couldn't afford a full orchestra. And though I would love to have a full orchestra here tonight along with uh, Mark and Benjamin, uh, that budget would be quite onerous. <laughs> but I think you will enjoy the um, insight, you get into the music of the composition when it's just two pianos. You're not going to be dazzled with all the orchestration and the flutes and the strings and all those different colors. Uh, with just the two pianos, you really hear the beauty of just the pure uh, composition that Debussy has. So, I will give some introduction to this period that Debussy is living in, and then uh, Mark and Benjamin will come up and play the first piece. You have the program in front of you. Um, and then I will continue with more of the lecture, then Mark will come back and do the set of preludes. A uh, prelude comes up a lot tonight. <laughs> but uh, and then more lecture, and then Mark will finish, Mark and Benjamin will finish with um, the two piano work noage or clouds. Uh, if you need to get up, which is very understandable, uh, please get up while I'm talking, not while the uh, music is being played. Also, I know you're very tempted to take out your cell phone and start recording and filming. Uh, I wish you wouldn't. It's very distracting to your neighbor. And we are having this videoed and recorded, so it will be uh, archived so that you can access it later. So I would appreciate if you would you know, keep your cell phones in your pocket and off. <laughs> so Achille Claude Debussy, by the time he's 30, he drops the first name Achille, and he's just known as Claude Debussy. Um, this period in France is called the Belle Epoque. 
and Paris becomes one of the, if not the major cultural center of the world, especially since it encompassed and accepted many different cultural influences from around the world. Um, Paris is often called the city of light. And let me just fast forward to, oh, no, sorry, I was correct. Um, as you see in this picture, the gas lights along the streets. Uh, we take it for granted the streets are lit at night. Um, up until the 1830s, there was no lighting on the streets, hardly at all during nighttime, which made the streets very dangerous in any city. And so there was virtually no nightlife. Uh, by 1870, um, under Napoleon III, Hausmann uh, reconfigures most of Paris into the big boulevards, big sidewalks, the very straight streets ending in a uh, circle. Uh, and along those streets, he installed uh, major gas lights. And this was an incredible important change in French and Parisian society because people could stay out till 10 o'clock at night, and they did and they sat along the cafes, they went to theaters, because now it was safe to be on the streets at night. Uh, Paris of the Belle Epoque was a moment of great change, not just Paris, of course, London, New York, all the major cities saw a huge increase in population. And to move that population even more and more, uh, buses were created, uh, cars began to be introduced. We tend to think, you know, as Americans, that everything was discovered and produced here. It, however, some of the very first car manufacturers were in uh, France. The man sitting in the car is Peugeot. Uh, I'm sorry, no, it's not. It's Renault. And even today, it's a, a quite well-known name for French automobiles. The picture to your left is one of the first major department stores of Paris. And then we don't think of this as like, a, this is a big innovation, but you have a rising middle class who have expendable income. And the big department stores, multi-stories, became possible uh, with also gas lighting in the interior. Uh, during this period, you have major, major uh, expositions actually three French international exhibits, 1879, 1889, 1900. These were culturally charged and very significant expositions for not only industry and commerce, but for the arts. Uh, the very first one, 1879, the most famous feature was, of course, the head of the Statue of Liberty, which was being given to the United States for its uh, 100th anniversary of 1876. Um, the Eiffel Tower, um, 1889, the largest structure in the world, and the first large example of girdered uh, steel and iron construction. The pace that this was built was astounding. And then, to your left, you would think you're in China or in Japan, and these were the pagodas of the Asian exhibit. And this was the first time many Europeans ever saw the Asian arts. Um, when you walked in, the print that you saw was a very famous print by the Japanese Hosei. I have the name later on, I'll pronounce it more correctly. Uh, so by the time WC is coming onto the scene, you have the beginnings of the Paris Metro, you have the famous uh, Paris Opera House, and other great buildings. Debussy was born to a rather poor family. Um, at the age of eight, his father is jailed and sent in prison because in 1870, uh, the French lost the Franco-Prussian War, and it was a huge defeat for the French. The Germans took Alsace and made the French pay major payments to them. Um, it was a very humiliating time 
for France. And the reaction against Napoleon III, the emperor for this great loss, is that there was a new government installed in Paris, and it was a communist commune. It didn't last a year before the right and the uh, industrialist class uh, put them down, and there were major fights in Paris, and the people who were involved with the Paris Commune were all thrown into jail. And Debussy's father was a lieutenant with the, the communists. And so while Debussy is young, his father is in jail. But the silver climbing on this cloud is that in Debussy's father's jail cell was a man whose mother was a very famous uh, piano teacher. And Debussy's father talked about his son's you know, uh, gifts with the piano already at that age. And so Debussy is taken to this lady and receives his first uh, formal piano lessons. But this was the street that Debussy was born on, as you can see. It's the old Paris of the winding streets, very narrow sidewalks. There's only a few parts of Paris that still look like this. So by the age of 10, Debussy takes the exams to enter the conservatory. The Paris conservatory, even from the days of Chopin and before, was considered one of the best places to get a music education. Um, soon, Debussy is in the first of his class for his piano playing. Um, though he did not pursue this as a career, as a performance career, Debussy, as we see in his piano music, had an amazing technique and insight to the piano. But this was not what he wanted to pursue as a career. He wanted to be a composer. Uh, early on in his compositions for assignments, for homework, the teachers would be sort of aghast at harmonies he would come up with because they were not what they considered correct, traditional harmonic progression. And we'll go into what Debussy was changing from that point. There was, in France, set up by the Minister of Culture, uh, and I just love when countries have a Minister of Culture. Um, the, you, there, were a, a prize, there was a prize given out to artists, writers, composers, to spend two years uh, studying at the Villa Medici, which the French government owned in Rome. The Villa Medici was, as it, you can imagine, was originally built by a Medici cardinal, and it's quite a structure, uh, a, probably one of the largest palaces of Rome. Uh, so at the age of 18, Debussy wins the, uh, what they call the Prix de Rome, or the Pr Prize of Rome. And Debussy is up there up towards your left, sitting with a white coat and a sort of very dashing hat. Um, he was not enthused with Rome. He really didn't get it. Uh, it was distracting to him. But two things while Debussy is uh, at the Villa Medici. We know for sure that Debussy and a friend of his, who was a pianist there, played for Franz Liszt a two piano transcription, it might have been four hands, but a, a, a transcription of Liszt's Faust Symphony. This is no small work. This is a major work, quite difficult, and it shows the level of technical prowess Debussy already had at 18 years of age. And we're pretty sure that Liszt probably played his Judo de Villa d'Este, which you heard Mark play here uh, for the Liszt lecture, and which presages the Impressionist and the color that Debussy will bring into his own music. Debussy was slow at composing, and though uh, winning the Prix de Rome made him very much the darling of French salon society. Uh, he was always short of cash, and his friends and associates knew that quite well. Uh, there was always begging, oh, I'll pay you back, or can you loan me? Uh, and this went throughout all his life. 
Um, so one way to meet expenses while he's still young was being hired by uh, Naz Nadziada uh, von Meck. She was the patron of Tchaikovsky, and she had convinced her husband in the 1860s to start building railroads in Russia. And of course, Russia is a big commodity export, especially for grain, so she became incredibly wealthy, and she was quite a businesswoman, very stern, very hard with her children. She arranged their marriages. But luckily enough for Debussy, it was a period where he could travel to Russia, be exposed to Russian music, especially in St. Petersburg, and then play quartet music for the fun mechs while they were in Russia and also Italy. Now, we call this period of French music Impressionism, taken from the painters of that period who were also given that uh, adjective. However, Debussy really didn't like that adjective at all. And when you see what Debussy reads and what he's following at this age, you really have to uh, see that his major influence are the poets of France. Now, I would, you know, maybe wrongly assuming, but you know, I would assume very few of us are very familiar with French poetry. Um, the poets Baudelaire, Verlaine, Mallarmé, you probably have heard their name, but uh, one thing that's interesting is that these poets were quite influenced by Edgar Allan Poe. And the, what I'm showing you here on this slide is Manet's cover, the famous painter uh, Manet. He did the cover for Mallarmé's translation of The Raven, Le Corbeau. And the Poe is considered by the French to have started the symbolist movement and poetry. And though I'm not an English major and certainly not an expert in uh, English poetry, I don't think there's really a movement we have that we call symbolists. But the symbolists believe that, it, that art should represent absolute truths that can only be described indirectly. Thus, they wrote in very metaphorical and suggestive manner, endowing particular images or objects with symbolic meaning. That's the term symbolist. Malachme writes in a letter to his friend Casalis, quote, to depict not the thing, but the effect it produces. And what we're really talking about is almost the psychological effect that these words have on you or on the writer or the psychology of the person or the situation this poem is addressing. And this is exactly what I think Debussy is attempting in music to evoke the image, a sense, an emotion. Now, Malarmé wrote uh, in 1876 the Prélude de la Pré Midi d'un Faune, or the Prélude of the Afternoon of a Faune. And it's a mythological situation of a faun who were pretty out there creatures of Greek mythology. Um, they were very sexual and always shown in bacchanalias, etc. And this is about a faun waking up in the afternoon and he's hearing some young maidens off in the forest and thinking, oh, I'm going to go have some fun. And he approaches them. And, and the poem is not short. If it was short, I would have included it in the program. But it's just quite a long poem. I mean, it's almost prose. Short to the end, the maidens reject him. They don't have anything to do with the fawn. He's disappointed, and so he just goes back to his lair and falls asleep. Um, the, again, Manet, who had worked with Marlarmé on the, the uh, Poe piece, did the cover illustration for this poem. So it's about 20 years later than that Debussy 
takes the poem and writes this piece in 1894. Uh, I sort of put these two pictures together because it looks like WC is like astonished to think that his orchestral piece will be produced in the Paris Opera House. Uh, the, in the next decade, there would be hundreds of performances of this piece. It was hugely popular and really shook the music foundations of Western Europe. Uh, it, throughout you know, Berlin, Vienna, London, Paris, United States. Debussy's prelude breaks with the overpowering German school championed by Wagner. In Debussy's youth, he greatly admired and studied Wagner. He could actually play many of the Wagner operas in piano transcriptions. Um, so he knew them quite well and went to Bayreuth, which is sort of the temple of ba uh, Wagner, and heard Tristan and Isolde and other uh, Wagner operas. But by the 1890s, um, especially with the uh, support of Eric Satie, who tells WC, you know, write for yourself, write what you hear and what you think is yourself, which is, of course, the French approach is very different than the German approach. Even you just hear the languages. Uh, they have a very different rhythm and meter. Uh, and so to put German meter and rhythm onto a French language just didn't seem right. And Debussy early on went to Mallarmé and Baudelaire's poetry to write songs, uh, which began this. So here Debussy is trying to create this new idiom. And what I've done here, and hopefully I can remember a bit of it on the piano, but I've didn't exactly bring the music, but there seems to be a conscious connection between Tristan and Isolde and its famous opening prelude and Debussy's prelude. Um, now, I am not even going trying to uh, approximate how you should pray, play the opening of Debussy's prelude. What I'm going to show you is that it's basically this winding down chromatic tune. You're going. Now, those of you who you know, studied music know that right away. That's the tritone, which is considered very unstable. But if I just go up and continue another whole step, you have the whole tone scale. And this was, uh, well, Liszt was one of the first to use it, but it becomes a major part of Debussy's vernacular. And then the Tristan and Isolde is And again, down in the bass, you have this tritone, but you hear that chromatic step up by step up by step up. And I'm sure to the audiences of 1894, uh, they knew exactly what he was referring to. Um, so uh, if we can raise the screen and bring our pianist and the lighting up, we will hear the performance of Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. This was transcribed by Maurice Ravel, a colleague of Debussy. And uh, as I said, it would be great if we had a full orchestra, but I feel very blessed to have such great pianists playing this piece. It is a tour de force in touch and in color and in rhythm and I think you really will enjoy it. Mark, Ben. There's a chair over there. Sorry. You want to do Mark or you? Okay. <coughs>
amazing. You hear the 20th century starting with that piece. Um, noticed how the ending was like, was not an ending like we normally would ex ex expect, you know, from the Beethoven bomb, 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 bomb. You know, it just sort of like peters away. It's like it could come back, maybe not come back. Um, and we will later in the uh, lecture talk about when this piece is brought back uh, almost 15, 16 years later, but as a ballet. But most, uh, and I for one, for you know, decades believed that it premiered as a ballet, and that is wrong. It premiered as a 10 minute orchestral piece. That was only 10 minutes. And it, it's, yeah, I mean, I just adore it. <laughs> I hope you did too. So, though we are very blessed in the music world to have Debussy uh, as such a great composer, you can't say exactly the same for the women in his lives. Uh, they did not have it easy. Um, not that Debussy was so different than the typical uh, male uh, Parisian society. Um, his first wife was a model. He married her in 1899. But he left her for a married woman. Uh, he met this second wife, um, uh, Emma Batsak, uh, from teaching her son piano lessons. And they were having an affair while she was still married. And when he told um, his first wife, Lily, that he was going to leave her, uh, she went to the Place de la Concorde, which is a very, very public place in Paris, and shot herself in the stomach with a pistol. Uh, she survived, which says something about the medical uh, progress in Paris at that time, that she could survive a gunshot wound to the stomach. Uh, later on, I mean, they get divorced, but the uh, Napoleonic Code is actually one of the most progressive laws and codes as to protecting women in a divorce or in separation. And so WC had to pay her an alimony uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, about 10 years later, she has to take him to court to get the back money he has owed her. Uh, in the end, it's WC's publisher, Durand, who pays the bills for that. Um, but uh, interesting about Emma, she was a singer, quite an accomplished uh, com uh, musician herself. Um, but this breakup with his first wife and the way he did it cost Debussy a lot of his long-term friends. And from then on, he was sort of ostracized by a lot of the Salon society uh, because of this. Uh, what's interesting is that it is the children of Emma's first marriage um, who inherit the copyright and the estate of Debussy, since the child that Emma and Debussy had together, Shushu, died in 1919 of diphtheria. Now, as we had seen with Chopin and Liszt, uh, parlor music was the major venue for people to uh, enjoy music. And here we see Debussy at the home of the fellow composer Chausson, Chausson was a quite well-to-do lawyer who dabbled in composition. And I shouldn't say dabble. I mean, he took it very seriously. His works are not that much known anymore. But he was very well respected by other composers. Uh, but he did have the means to have a very nice salon life. And you can just imagine Debussy playing perhaps a one piano version of uh, the prelude or a transcription of a Wagner opera or some of his own songs. Um, Parisian society was supported mostly by very wealthy women. Uh, some of them married into it, some of them inherited it. Uh, this particular woman, Winneretta Singer, as you can imagine from her last name, she was a daughter of Isaac Singer, the inventor of the sewing machine, and one of the wealthiest persons uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, he had something like over 20 children. Uh, we, we, we can't keep count because he didn't own up to all of them. Um, 
but she um, inherited a massive fortune. Uh, her first marriage, which was arranged, she stood on the top of her boudoir and screamed for the police if the man touched her. Um, that marriage was annulled uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and she marries the Prince de Polignac, an old French uh, noble family, uh, and he was gay and well known you know, to be gay. So it was what we called a mariage blanc, a white marriage, which suited both of them very well. She had the money and he had the class. Um, and that was their little home in Paris in the middle. And look at that music room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she was a great supporter of the arts. Uh, one thing that she is famous for is in the 1920s after World War I, she and um, a, another American heir of the Astor fortune uh, built low-income housing in Paris, never been done before, uh, and built the first public hospital for the poor. Uh, quite admirable. Um, so I mentioned that later on, um, the Prelude to the Afternoon of the Fawn is staged as a ballet. Uh, this is the backdrop to that staging. It was designed and painted by Leon Box, who was a contemporary of WC. He came from Russia uh, and was a, a very prominent painter and is all right, uh, but was very well known for set designs and costume designs. Um, these are some of the people that made this ballet happen. Diaglyev uh, was the director of the Ballet Russe, and they started dancing uh, in Paris in the early 1900s and took Paris by storm because they presented very unconventional choreography. Uh, the very famous male ballet dancer uh, Nijinsky was the principal, and also he was a very uh, clever and gifted choreographer. However, the woman who brought the ballet russe to Paris, underwrote them, and basically paid for this production, was a woman very, very famous uh, among Parisian uh, art world, Misha Sert. Uh, Misha uh, had three husbands. Um, her first husband made a deal with her second husband that her second husband would pay off all his debts if he would release Misha and divorce her so he could marry her. Uh, sort of unconventional. But Misha Sert was probably one of the most painted women of the Belle Epoque. Uh, everybody painted her, Renoir, Monet, uh, and the, there's a painting of her at the piano, and she was quite an accomplished pianist, so much so that she could cr accompany Caruso, the famous tenor, at the piano in her own salon. Uh, the, besides promoting the arts, she was the first person to recognize the talents of Coco Chanel and encouraged and funded Coco Chanel's first boutique uh, in uh, Rue Saint-Honoré in Paris. And what's interesting is to look at the change in women's dress from the painting of the previous slide to there is uh, Misha at the Grand Canal in Venice in the uh, 1920s. Uh, you obviously see the influence of Coco Chanel. Um, the preludes are the next group of pieces we are going to hear. Uh, these are solo piano pieces. And they were written in two books. Um, but Debussy is obviously uh, referring back to two great sets of preludes, one written by Johann Sebastian Bach in the 17th century, I'm sorry, 18th century. Um, and Bach wrote two books of preludes. Um, however, each prelude has its own fugue. Uh, it is 
One of the great pillars of music history are these 24 preludes and fugues. Fast forward to the uh, mid 19th century, Chopin, who we covered uh, last year, um, wrote a set of 24 preludes. And he does the same thing as Bach. He goes up all the, through all the keys of the piano. Uh, what I mean by that is that you have C major, then you have C minor, then you have C sharp major, then you have C sharp minor, and then D major, D minor, going up, 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 uh, through every key. Now, Debussy doesn't do this. He breaks that convention. Um, but here, Debussy takes the uh, influence of a very famous American painter who shows um, at this time. Um, the, what's interesting also is that uh, during the war years, uh, Debussy, to earn some money, uh, does an edition of Chopin. What this means when you ask somebody to do an edition is they go as much to the original manuscripts and to the very first printed editions to see what was really the correct note that Chopin wanted in this phrase. Uh, if you ever see a handwritten score, you can see how the printer could make a mistake. Uh, this took a lot of work, but also shows Debussy's great appreciation uh, for the piano works of Chopin. Um, so with these poems, uh, I'm sorry, with these works, the preludes, they're in a lot sort of the symbolist poetry in that Debussy is trying to convey an atmosphere, a mood, a sense. Uh, rather than just give you beautiful melody and accompaniment. Um, the, I sort of mixed up the order that they are usually presented in the uh, book, but uh, we will be hearing uh, six of them. And they're in your program uh, with the translations there for you. Uh, the third one, La Fille aux Chevaux, is the girl on the horse is probably the most familiar uh, you will hear it tonight. Um, the last one, uh, well, let me go back a bit. Uh, the, one of the ones is you're going to hear is a walk in the snow, a passo niege. And I purposely chose a Japanese print because they, again, were a big influence on the French at this time. But just imagine, I mean, we just went through our snowmageddon. Uh, when you went outside that first morning, it was utter quiet. And you could hear the crunch as you're trying to get through the snow. And I think this is very much what Debussy is trying to evoke, as well as sort of that desolation, that quiet. Uh, this is not our normal atmosphere, this snow-covered landscape. Uh, the other one, the sounds and perfumes. Uh, imagine you're on the porch of a garden or along the seaside and you're smelling and hearing um, nature directly. And then with atmosphere, we have one called the Cliffs of Capri. Uh, Capri in Italy was just beginning to be a major vacation spot for the wealthy. And I think you'll get this sense of the sun hitting the cliffs and the play of water. So we will ask Mark to come back and perform the preludes.
Whew. You see what I mean by senses and emotion. Um, I mean, I'm still getting goosebumps. Uh, that last piece, the sunken cathedral, I mean, you can almost imagine, I mean, this is, I mean, Debussy's writing this before the days of scuba diving, but just think, you know, you're down in the water depths and all at once this ancient you know, structure is rising in the background and the water is all making it blurry. I mean, Debussy just catches that fantastically. Um, the, uh, the first, um, I'm sorry, the next to the last piece, I hope you heard a sense of Spain. Uh, you definitely had Spanish rhythms there. And actually, the idea is sort of a, a rendezvous between two people, who, let's say, in Sevilla, southern Spain, and they keep on getting interrupted by public walking by. But uh, I will later touch on, touch on how uh, Spanish idioms in the Spanish school were very popular among the French composers at this period. Um, at this point, uh, Debussy writes another very famous um, orchestral piece, uh, La Mer, or the Sea. And for that um, uh, uh, publication, the actual cover of the music, when it was published, took a piece of art that Debussy owned, and it was a very famous print of the wave by the Japanese artist Hokusai. Um, what's interesting is the use in this, and in other pieces you might have heard, is what we call the pentatonic scale. And basically, if you just play the, the black keys of the piano, you are doing the pentatonic, pentatonic scale, which immediately makes you think of Asia. Sorry about that. Um, and one of the a big influence on Debussy in the idea of sounds and scales uh, and the different kinds of scales you can use. Um, you know, we just know basically the two in Western music. Uh, the major scale, the minor scale, and Certain, <laughs> I gotta watch myself on that. Um, and variations of, but actually, even the Greeks had what we call modes or different scales. Uh, and this became popular among the French composers of this period. And this is what we're hearing in some of the preludes and other pieces of Debussy. This is a picture of Debussy with Igor Stravinsky in the apartment of Debussy. Uh, take a look up above to the right, top right. You'll see the copy of that print of La Mer, or the wave. Uh, Debussy and uh, Stravinsky were good friends. Uh, Stravinsky and Debussy belonged to a group called Les Apaches which were called, it's a, a French slang term for hooligans. And in that group, you had Ravel, Defaya, uh, Stravinsky, uh, and other writers and composers. Uh, at this point, in, between 1900 and 1920, Stravinsky himself produces some very groundbreaking pieces, the Rite of Spring being probably the best known. Again, as a ballet that was produced by Diaghilev and danced by Nijinsky. I mentioned the Spanish school. Now, Spain it was late coming into the Industrial Revolution, but by the 1870s, 1880s, especially in Barcelona, you have major school of composition. Uh, the leading exponent of that was Isaac Albéniz. Uh, Albéniz Pieces for piano are some of the most challenging in the literature. Um, but you, when you hear them, you immediately are thinking of Spain. Um, 
and Debussy respected quite a, a lot the music of Albanis. Uh, a generation after Albanis and Debussy is Manuel de Falla, uh, whose works are mostly well known for uh, their transcription as solo guitar. Uh, the person next to Emmanuel de Falla was his lover for many years, Frederica Garcia Lorca. Sorry, I broke off the last name there, but Lorca. Lorca was a famous, famous uh, Spanish poet who was killed by Franco in the Spanish Civil War. And let's just look at some of the other characters uh, that were you know, involved with Debussy's works and who were good friends and associates. Pierre Louis uh, was originally from Ghent, Belgium. Um, he is most famous for his series of um, poems and prose called the Songs of Bilitis, Les Chansons de Bilitis, which had a very strong lesbian theme, uh, was divided into three sections, each representing the phase of Bilitis' life. Uh, the, Luis uh, made these famous by claiming he had discovered an unfound work of a contemporary of Sappho, the famous Greek woman uh, poet. Um, now that's marketing. <laughs> and then Andre Caplet, whose name I never had heard until I started uh, work on this lecture. And he worked with Debussy, especially the last 10 years, on the orchestration of his pieces. Uh, Debussy, by this time, is suffering from rectal cancer, and it's really debilitating him, and makes it very slow for him to write. And this is not atypical in the music world, in composition, that the composer sketches out what he wants, gives it to a colleague who understands his style of orchestration, and will write out the parts. Now, obviously, they go back and forth and refine it, but uh, Caplet uh, was incredibly helpful in Debussy in his final years and realizing a lot of the orchestral sc scores of his works. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he fought in World War I. He was gassed, and by 1922, he dies of uh, bronchial problems. Um, and then probably one of the most outrageous characters of this time, Eric Satie. Uh, I mean, the pictures you know, show all his different guises, but he was known just to wear a single dark suit with a vest. He and Debussy became close friends in the 1890s and had lunch almost every day. And as I said earlier, it was Satie who told Debussy, you know, drop the Wagner, drop the German school, become your own. Um, Debussy lived into the 1920s, died of cirrhosis of the liver, uh, was very much of a pauper in his last days. Um, what, uh, Debussy is probably best known for an experimental work uh, that was underwritten by Misha Sert, and that is La Parade. La Parade, uh, I believe it's 1918 or 1919. And the sets are by Leon Box. No, I'm sorry, the sets are by Picasso. Uh, the, uh, the, and the music is by Satie, and the libretto is by Cocteau. Um, it was not easy to get this produced because they all were major, major uh, you know, characters in their own right. Um, but uh, the Debussy hugely respected uh, Satie's music. And then one of the last works, that, uh, big works that Debussy works on uh, is The Martyrdom of Saint Sebastian. Uh, this was a libretto written by Gabriella D'Annunzio, uh, the famous uh, symbolist poet from, and writer from Italy, uh, D'Annunzio writings. I, I don't really see how they were able to find it in his writings, but it was very heavily used by the fascists in Italy, um, which sort of put a damper on uh, you know, history's thinking of D'Annunzio. Um, 
Here, again, Diaghilev is uh, leading the production. Uh, Leon Box does the sets as well as the costumes. And then the person who underwrites this production, though, is Ida Rubinstein. And there's a sketch of her by Box in one of the costumes for St. Sebastian. Um, this was quite a, um, a controversial work because with this production, a woman is playing the role of this Catholic saint who was a Roman soldier who converted. And when the emperor tells him he has to go back being pagan, he is then um, uh, martyred. And there are famous statues and paintings of him you know, with arrows through him that his soldiers were told to shoot into him. Um, the paintings and sculptures are often very, very, you know, homoerotic in a way. Uh, and of course, this production that they do plays on that. But let's talk a bit about Ida Rubinstein. Uh, those of you who uh, have done modern dance or studied it, uh, probably know her name quite well. She was one of the original principal dancers in the Ballet Russe, but she never was trained as a ballet dancer. Around the age 16 in St. Petersburg, both her parents die, and they were one of the wealthiest Jewish families in St. Petersburg. They were um, a commodity uh, brokers. And so she inherits this major fortune at 16, and she decides she's going to do a production of Salome in St. Petersburg, uh, which in itself was sort of racy at that time. This was, the, of course, a Salome, um, Oscar Wilde. And she hires Fulkin, who at that time is the major choreographer for Diaghilev, to design the ballet that she's going to dance the principal part in. Uh, what was extremely racy in this production now, mind you, she's 17 in St. Petersburg, not exactly the most liberal society at that time. She ends the play completely stark naked on the stage. Um, her uncle uh, locked her up in an asylum, think that she had had it. The rest of the family thought, you know, let her be, have a free spirit. So they get her out of the asylum, they send her to Paris with her fortune, and she's there in Paris for the next 30 some years. Uh, with that amazing resources financially, she underwrote quite a lot of theatrical productions in Paris. Uh, probably the greatest credit to Ida Rubinstein we can give is that she's the one who commissioned Maurice Ravel to write the Bolero that she premiered in in 1928. And along with the prelude to the Athenian of the Fawn, you'd have to say Bolero is among the top 10 most seminal pieces of 20th century music. Uh, so we have Ida Rubinstein to thank for that. Um, but you just have to go through pages of the costumes she wore and you realize, I mean, this is like couture. Uh, it's not just something simply thrown together. Now the last piece, uh, again will be a two piano piece, is based on a, uh, a set of paintings, uh, a show that James Abbott McNeil Whistler uh, presented in Paris around 1900 called Nocturnes. Uh, Whistler became quite a hero of the artists and musicians at the time when in I believe it was around 1889, uh, he had just gotten out of a huge lawsuit with Ruskin and lost the lawsuit. So in 1889, he holds this lecture in London at 10 p.m. and he expounds upon the crisis of, that artists and musicians are facing because of the Industrial Revolution, the commercialization of art, and this homogenization of art for the masses. Um, and I'm going to quote just a bit because I think it shows the direction that Debussy and Ravel and a lot of the French school are taking. 
Um, nature contains the elements of color and form of all pictures, as the keyboard contains the notes of all music. But the artist is born to pick and choose and group with science these elements, that the results may be beautiful as the musician gathers his notes and forms his chords until he brings forth from chaos glorious harmony. To say to the painter that nature is to be taken as is, and he's referring, of course, to pure representational painting, which the conservatives uh, held up as the ideal against the Impressionists, that nature is always right is an assertion artistically as untrue as it was one whose truth is universally taken for granted. Nature is very rarely right, to such an extent even that it is almost be said that nature is usually wrong. That is to say, the conditions of things that shall bring about the perfection of harmony worthy of a picture is rare and not common at all. The, I would suggest when you have sort of a quiet evening is to look up this lecture. It's quite flowery language. Of course, this is the end of the 19th century, but some of the paragraphs you'll want to read four or five times. It is a, a quite profound treatise. But here with these nocturnes, and I um, show you some of the paintings of the show that Whistler uh, did at this time. Um, the, again, we're evoking a mood, an atmosphere, um, you know, just a sense. And this piece, uh, which is originally uh, was written for orchestra by Debussy, uh, the Nocturnes, there's three of them. And uh, the, the first one is called Nuage, or Clouds. And so, again, try, you know, how often we do this on Vashon, whether it's a changing weather or a beautiful blue sky, that just, you look up in the clouds and you see images, and you start to imagine uh, you know, immediately. And I think this is very much what Debussy is trying to evoke, and obviously what uh, Rissler was trying to evoke in paintings. So Mark and Ben, please, the Nawash. And Christopher, can you? Let me advance the slide here.
uh, I uh, hold, wholly suggest that you also um, explore the orchestral version of uh, the Nocturnes, um, a quite beautiful, beautiful uh, pieces of uh, late Debussy, as you heard with the two piano version. Again, that was arranged by Maurice Ravel. Um, I think that last nocturne, though, the clouds, uh, also has a symbolic use of the word clouds and the, the clouds that are coming over Europe at this time. Uh, it was already early in 1905 to 1910 that there was the rumblings of this huge competition between England, France, Germany, and Russia. These empires were all uh, trying to outpace the other in the military industrial uh, complex and buildup of armaments and ships was increasing throughout, throughout Western Europe. And so the, the powder keg was being laid all around Europe, just ready, ready to be ignited. And the 1918 saw the end of what we call the Belle Epoque. Actually, the term Belle Epoque was developed around 1920 to describe the period which everybody looked at, back on with uh, remorse that it was already gone. Uh, 1918 saw the end of the Russian Empire, the end of the German Empire, the end of the, um, uh, the uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, you had revolutions throughout. Uh, the, the communist and socialist movements were becoming more and more powerful uh, because the working class, especially industrial working class, were no longer accepting 14, 18 hour work days and minimum wages. Um, and the map of Europe changes. Certain countries come back that had not been around for 200 years. Uh, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary uh, become their own country. And then, of course, in the 1920s is when the fundamental changes of how we fund our government, uh, we instituted the income tax uh, in this country and in other countries. To give a perspective of what World War I did to uh, the culture and environment. Uh, France lost one and a half million uh, lives in uh, World War I. That was 5% of the population at that time. Uh, Russia lost something 3.3 million. And then, of course, on top of this whole period, you have the, um, the influenza epidemic, which wiped out millions and millions of people worldwide. Uh, by the 1920s, you have uh, a huge breakdown in what was considered the old order. And uh, the new order, which is sort of what we are living in today, uh, was what started after the death of WC. Um, and with that, um, if we can turn on some lights to the mm -hmm. audience, um, I'll take some questions. Oh, this is um, another piece by uh, Whistler, part of the Nocturnes. So any questions? Anybody have any comments or inquiries? Uh, do I see a hand back there, yes. What was the uh, view from uh, Germany and Austria of Debussy? Good question. Uh, they, the public loved his music. I mean, he was uh, performed in Berlin. He was performed in uh, Vienna. Uh, Debussy actually traveled throughout Germany, Italy, even as far as Russia, to conduct the Prelude to the Afternoon and the Fawn. Um, now, of course, the German school of music uh, had a very different opinion. I mean, you, you realize at this point, nationalism is a major force in the politics. And so you sometimes wonder if they're really not pushing a political agenda rather than an artistic agenda. Uh, but his music was popular. Uh, 
Yes. So you said that uh, he came from a poor background, and yet he was playing the piano at a young age, and even before his father met this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, if I remember correctly, I mean, for one thing, owning a small little upright was not expensive. And they were very affordable, and probably easily somebody in your neighborhood would have one. And I think that's how WC first played on one. It was not his family's uh, uh, piano. Um, but yeah, he, he basically came from a very, very poor background. But what's amazing is that once you uh, were accepted to the Paris Conservatory, um, education was completely paid for. Now, of course, he had to support his life and he lived with his family, but at least they didn't have to pay for the education. Any, yes, yes, Anne. Uh, and asked when the composers or artists won the Prix de Rome and went to Rome, they actually had an assignment. Uh, they were supposed to produce uh, works and hand them to the conservatory and they would make a judgment whether this was acceptable for the time there. Uh, to be very frank, Debussy just sort of like said to hell with it. I mean, he didn't really get into the whole Rome scene. He was very distracted had a hard time composing, so he didn't really live up to his part of the deal on that one. Any more questions? Well, thank you all so much for coming. Oh, oh, sorry, so, yes, yes. To, to what extent, listening to your lecture very carefully, to what extent can we see the music of the composers as reflections of the time they live in? Um, The question was, how did the music of Debussy reflect his time? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, how did it reflect his culture? Um, it, it reflected part of it. Um, the, like, the songs and small piano pieces were very uh, evident of the musical uh, parlors at that time. Debussy frequented the cafes along with Satie and would play the piano uh, in the cafes. Um, and he was influenced as much by the beginnings of jazz, like um, uh, the ragtime uh, was very popular in the early 1900s in Paris. Um, I, I think the, what is the relationship with that period is the exploring of new ways to do things. Um, you see it in painting, you see it in sculpture, you see it in writing. Uh, no longer are the traditional forms and sets and, uh, that have been so much for two, three hundred years. This was being, people wanted to get rid of it. They wanted to be new, they wanted to be different. And I think that's where WC is very much in tune with that period. Yes, Anne. Could we ask the pianist? Oh, yeah. Could you explain oh. how they get from the imitation of playing like today to the performance? Well, it's, it's practice. <laughs> <laughs> but in, I know it's, we're, we're getting towards the end, but I thought we probably would like to hear Mark or Ben play uh, another piece, if you'd like. Yes, yes. Mark? And uh, what will it be, Mark? Let's play the, uh, let's do the uh, Minstrels, the last of the uh, preludes. Okay. He's going to play the last of the preludes called Minstrel, which is sort of a takeoff on uh, uh, the ragtime and minstrel shows that were very popular in Paris at that time. And while we're setting up, I do want to remind you again that um, June 9th, Sunday at 1 o'clock, uh, Mark will be coming back with his other son, who's a cellist, and will be doing uh, the life and works of Maurice Ravel.
Thank you and good night.